Hey, everybody. Welcome to Pep Talks. And uh, this is Eddie Pepitone and my buddy Steve Lolly. Say hello, Steve. And, hey, uh, everybody. We are lucky today, folks. We have a genuine uh, badass uh, comedian. And, and a lot of you folks, you just work in jobs where, I don't know, you, you go in and you drool on a desk and <laughs> you, you, you have ulcers. You have ulcers that eat you out from the inside because you never pursued your dreams. Eh, we pursue our dreams. And the guy next to me <laughs> is a badass comedian. and He does what you wanted to do uh, with your life. But instead, you wound up in a carpet store. <laughs> and... <laughs> You wound up in a carpet store in Ohio, yeah. and you know, it's it's it. Anyway, Tom Rhodes, welcome, Tom. Rhodes. <laughs> That's so, what, a, what a beautiful picture of your listeners you just painted. <laughs> Everybody's working in a carpet store. Wouldn't it be funny if all my listeners were just all Stevie and me's li listeners are just these like guys who barely can get out of bed their dreams are shattered <laughs> drooling on their desks drooling on drooling their desks desk. desk. you know cubicle. you know how you how you can see in offices who is the closest to suicide in an office cubicle a cat calendar <laughs> <laughs> that's very close i was going to say hang who, in there and the cat's like ah, hang in there <laughs> I was going to say it's who has the most pictures of either their vacation mm. or their family. Like if you see, you know, someone sitting in a cubicle and they have just, this is Hawaii, like 30 pictures of, you know. I had a dentist when I first came to L.A. And, and in his you don't have waiting, to brag. I, I also have a dentist. In his waiting room, he had all of his vacation pictures and like. I thought that Did, breed breeded resentment among the, you know, <laughs> like, why, why do I got to look at this asshole on a boat in Hawaii? Dentists you know? are weird motherfuckers. The dentists are fucking They're weird. They are fucking yeah. weird, man. Can, can I tell you a story that, that I had a dentist? Feeding blood to plants, things. Oh, it's Little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> See, I knew that. I got that. Good reference. How about Good. Michael Palin in Brazil? Do you remember that? Oh, was he a yeah. dentist? Was that uh, and then was it Marathon Man where he? Uh, oh yeah, Dustin Hoffman got the drill in the front tooth. Yeah, yeah Doctor Mengele. Max von Sydow. Yeah, yeah. No, that no, was that Olivier. was uh, Olivier. Oh, okay. It's yeah, easy sure. to uh, mistake Sydow for Olivier. All those old white fucking actors, stage when? actors. Oh, you don't have to. See, we're men of a certain age. We can. You guys can <laughs> yeah. slap down a Max von Sydow <laughs> reference. Yeah, yeah. Wait, you was... prick! That was Olivier. Max von Sydow was Exorcist, right? It was Exorcist. Yes, he was what? also in a in a Woody Allen movie that I loved. I think it was Hannah and her yeah, sisters. Yeah, he played the artist. He played the artist, and he does it. Do you remember Hannah and her sisters? Mm, no, <laughs> I saw it, but I don't remember. No, I, oh, you don't remember? Yeah. yeah, I don't remember a lot. They either. all kind of blend in. Was that? That's not the one. I'm going to throw a couple of Barcelona. Really, that's the one where no. uh, someone wants to fuck <laughs> someone's wife. I, I just remember that. Let me guess. There's an older guy, and yeah. he likes a younger girl. No, he's How married. Did you know? To the How younger. did you know? <laughs> How did you know that about Woody? <laughs> um, so, uh, Tommy, you have been. Does, does anybody call you Tommy? I've never only heard. very good friends. Is that right? I told you. I'll call you so, Thomas. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, no. We've known each other. Yeah, for, we've known each other. How long have years? you guys known each other? Years at least. Is it that long? Yeah. Holy shit! Wow. Yeah. So, um, uh, so you can call me Tommy. You can't. <laughs> you have to call I'd him. feel strange Mr. calling Mr. Rhodes. Mr. Rhodes. Wasn't that a show you had? It was, yeah. Okay, well, that oh, would be shit. appropriate then. Yeah. That's appropriate. Oh, shit. Now, that is true, man. Did you have long hair back then? I did. I was skinny, had long hair, and uh, yeah. You've been through, uh, we talked about that a little. Size 28-inch waist. Did you ever have long hair, Eddie? <sighs> no. Okay. I mean, I love long hair. You know? I like the sideburns, bro. You don't need Yeah, that. I do up the sideburns sometimes, you know? But... um. Watch me. This I just get a long distance stare. Oh yeah, I used to do up the sideburns, but <laughs> I want to talk about uh, Tom, who is a comic. And again, this goes to you folks out there, whose dreams uh, died on the vine. But <laughs> Tom, <laughs> dreams dying on a vine. Isn't that why we watch 
a lot. And by the way, I'm just kidding you folks. All of our dreams die on the phone. Eddie, that should be There's a song. nothing wrong with carpet stores. <laughs> oh, <laughs> There's nothing yes. wrong with Cat carpet. calendars are perfectly fine. <laughs> it's not a cry for help. I'd rather be in a carpet store than a cubicle. I'll just say That's that. true. I'd rather yeah. be stuck in a fucking <laughs> carpet store than a cubicle. Yeah. If you got to choose. If you, those were the two hells I you agree. had to choose between. Yeah. There's you can wear rollerblades around the warehouse, things like that. Right, you know, right. You make it fucking fun. off when the boss is away. Yeah, you know. But the fucking cubicle with the fluorescent lighting that draws all the vitamins out of your body, that that'll that suicide. That's fucking kill yourself and others quickly. Can I tell you the last office job I had to just show you how long ago it was was in the World Trade Center. Stop. Wow. I was in the World Trade Center, um, and. It was, I mean, I'm such a fuck up when it comes to anything corporate or organized. And I had to look up, the, the gig was I was a temp. And, <laughs> and, and I also do this, folks, so you can feel like, you know, I can relate to you. You know, because usually my life is one of endless creativity and a lot of sex. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I, I had to look up, um, the, I was given a huge hotel brochure for I, uh, hotels listed. Hotels were listed. I forget the listing and find out if they still exist. And it was, it was, it was so disorganized. What I wound up doing after day three, and it was a two week job is I pretended to do it and I would just say this one does without checking anything I would just sit at my desk and it, it was before the internet not to brag that I lived life <coughs> before the internet I didn't need anything how old were you then Eddie I was three <laughs> my dad put me to work I'm as walking a toddler. around with cassette tape so <laughs> you don't talk about before the that's internet that's true you know I didn't even really Tom <laughs> handed me a cassette the wisdom of Malcolm X and that's the kind of guess I get, I get people who listen to Malcolm X, white people who listen to Malcolm X. By it's, the way, it's, it's, a, it's a cassette of his speeches. When I, I lived yeah. in San Francisco years ago. Uh, I, in, I didn't the, think it would be a cassette of him puttering around the house. I don't know, <laughs> I don't singing, know what you're doing. Just, just gardening <laughs> tips. Uh, you yeah. know, when you're trying to keep uh, birds of paradise at summer peak. Um, I will not have a white lily. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I lived in this, uh, it was a black neighborhood when I lived in San Francisco. Now it's been gentrified, but oh, that's there were all these, uh, these great, that's a shocker. great little militant, um, kiosk shops. And, uh, and I bought that years ago and it's all, it's all, it's all his speeches and, and anti-white rhetoric always calms me down. <laughs> I love how, I love how you handed it to him and it was empty. Well, because it's because it's still in the yeah, little, but still, I got the was, Sony Walkman thing. If, was, if you didn't explain that, it could have been just a fucked up metaphor. For, I had an interesting <clears throat> ride over with this um, Syrian driver. I was listening to oh, you Malcolm took a X. Cab. I took a, a, a lift. Yeah. And then, uh, and I, 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 uh, I took it out, and then, because I didn't know the route the guy was taking, and he was like, what are you listening to? Did he say that to yeah, you? Yeah, and then he, and he, he, he was, was he cool? Muslim, young guy from, cool from Syria. Cool escaped dude. Assad, from Syria? yeah, from Syria, oh, wow. and he didn't know the story of of, of Malcolm X. Oh, that nice. um, the amazing thing of his life, where he was, you know, kill whitey, and he didn't didn't want blacks and whites together. And Martin Luther King Jr. was like, you he know, was a pimp, wasn't peaceful. He? He, well, originally, yeah, Detroit Red was his. Uh, wow, I didn't know that. That was his. He was a pimp and a drug dealer. Right. He used to drive ride the train from from New York. He worked on the train from New York to Boston and. Was running drugs and stuff. Oh shit! And uh, and then he becomes you know nation of Islam guy, right. but he went to uh, you know and he was like you know Didn't very very much a kill whitey. Do you, uh, think, do you think the they killed him his own? Uh, then yeah, the nation of Islam killed why him. Why did they government. kill him? Well, because uh, the, the uh, Elijah Muhammad, his mentor, was kind of fucking around with young girls in the nation of Islam and doing some other unsavory things that. Malcolm X um, kind of, you know, on. well, he didn't call him out, but it just, it tarnished his image of his hero. Uh -huh. And then the big transform, transformative moment in his life was when he went to Mecca mm -hmm. for his Hajj mm -hmm. and he prayed next to white Muslims. And he realized that there might be a couple of decent white people. 
and uh, and that's when he came back and realized that you know we're all God's children and that you know this he was wrong about his his anti white yeah, thing. Fascinating. Man. So I mean the, the guy's life is pretty amazing, but the tape I have is still very much kill whitey. <laughs> and I love that it calms you. Down. It calms me because uh, I was talking about panic a uh, panic attacks before. Uh, we got on the air, and I usually have panic attacks in public. And it would be funny if the only thing that calmed me down was Malcolm X, like you orating try it. <laughs> <laughs> against white men. You know, like, the thing about I need angry. Malcolm X. Like, like I'm in an <laughs> I need airport. my I need my ex. Somebody, my ex. <laughs> no think more Kalanip in you. Here's just a put Xanax, on sir. Malcolm here's X. Here's a Xanax. No, 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 Malcolm X. <laughs> Malcolm X. But Tom, I want to talk to you also. Uh, about the fact that I'm going to Amsterdam. Um, or, uh, Fun playing city. Tumblers, and you live there. Tom had a show there. Tell, talk about that for a sec. I I have a deep, long history with the Netherlands. I think it's a, 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 a there's so much to tell you about before your trip. Uh, the number one mm-hmm. thing that you should know is Tumbler is the oldest, best comedy club of Amsterdam. And it is probably one of the greatest names for a comedy club ever. It is. Is that a Jewish Tumler is a Jewish Yiddish word, which means traveling merrymaker. Back in, you know, uh, the days when there were Jewish ghettos all over Europe and, and, you know, Jews were the poor side Mm -hmm. of town, there were these guys that traveled from ghetto to ghetto and they had funny songs, they... They had jokes and stories, and they were traveling merrymakers. They were tumblers. Yeah, and I love that name and, too. Uh, you so know, Steve is is versed in. Uh, I didn't, I never heard of uh, tumbler. Oh, you never never did? heard. And you're a Jew, actually. Come on, by I, don't so I, think, I think that's probably. I don't want you saying that. Not on when the you air. go to Europe. <laughs> 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 oh my God! No one knew before now. <laughs> uh, so it. it's uh, it's uh, it's probably one of the best names for a comedy club ever. It is. Kind of in the basement of the Amsterdam Hilton, there's the side. It used to be a jazz club, uh, which was I've played it, which was mafia owned, and there was a murder, uh, a mafia hit in there. Which in is Tumblers? Once upon a time, Holy I mean, the comedy shit. store used to be Ciro's, well, which was a, a mafia owned uh, jazz club. There was a so, murder so there. So the yeah, many and suicides. There were many murders. That's why. I think sometimes I have a bad set. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's uh, there's a bad vibe. It's sometimes. Uh, <laughs> some guy named Lefty hanging out in the in the rafters. But uh, so so Tumor uh, that jazz club closed and then uh, Tumor opened and uh, you know they it's mostly it's all Dutch comedy all year round and in the summer they give the Dutch comedians a break to write new shows. And then they bring in the touring international acts, uh, English and American, Irish, Australian, whoever. And then also this allows the Dutch comedians to go there and study from the masters. So it's pretty genius. And Tumblr is, my life was transformed in that room. Is that right? Yeah, because I, the very first time I went to Amsterdam was to perform a Tumblr. Wow. And I ended Were up- Were you a sitcom <clears throat> star back then? It was after my sitcom. Okay. So my sitcom was 96 to 97. I think the first time I went to Amsterdam was 98, 99. I think 99. By the way, when I hear 98. Yeah, it was 99. When it, I hear 98, 99, I think, oh, that wasn't too long ago. But damn, it was, it was 20 years ago. Yeah. So I ended up uh, falling in love with a, uh, a waitress, a girl that worked at Tumler. And then she's now a, a very well-known actress in can you tell us who or no uh yeah anique pfeiffer who anique pfeiffer she's done movies and tv and a lot of national theater and stuff we're still friends and um goes without saying but we he's bragging why am i bragging no because it's something eddie says all the time i'm just i'm just trying to tag eddie's we're just fucking with you no you know you're telling you the story you know you're interesting because you you're a serious cat like you have a serious it's interesting. Yeah, he's listening to Malcolm X on the con- you know. <laughs> thing. He's obviously <laughs> maybe I should listen, <clears throat> something more lighthearted. On you? Me. No, not at all. Not at all. But sometimes when sometimes when when I talk to you, and you'll you'll do that kind of thing. Why is it? You'll go. You have a gravitas. You go. Why? <laughs> what did you just say to Steve? Why is that? Why am I bragging? That's why what is I said. that bragging? Yeah. 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 But it was done with a like you know like. 
a guy in Ciro's who's like, <laughs> uh, you got a problem? <laughs> So, uh, the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, there is uh, nothing back to say to the that. story. Right, telling yeah, 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 telling yeah, you the story of my story. life. So, uh, I ended up moving to Amsterdam. I thought, you know, I lived in San Francisco. The for girl years. had a lot to do with that. The I girl is the reason why I moved to Amsterdam. And love is why he moved. He has not been love laid. is the reason to move anywhere. He love. has not been laid since an accident. I'm just throw <laughs> oh, that okay. out there. Go All ahead. Right. Go ahead. So, uh, yeah, and it's funny, like, when, you know, people, you bring up Amsterdam and people are like, hookers and drugs. It's ah, like, fuck that. it's, the, 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 it's, a, it's a wonderful, progressive country, and uh, the, the regular people there, uh, you know, are well worth falling in love with. So um, uh, yeah. it sounds like it's a Dutch Catskills, the Tumblers place. It's like a no, because the Catskills was old hacky comedians. Oh, okay. This is progressive. But what you were saying was a place for young comics to come and learn from the masters, kind of a thing. And yeah, but the Catskills was old mother-in-law jokes and things like that. This place is uh, is, is cutting edge. Cutting edge, mm -hmm. and uh, they they're more on the alternative side of comedy than they are on you know hacky kind right. of. Catskill, Vegasy type acts. So anyway, so I so I lived in Amsterdam for years, and for me, Amsterdam. I'm sorry, San, San Francisco uh, mm -hmm. for seven years, and for me, San Francisco was uh, my left wing utopia. You know, because I grew up in Florida, my family are all conservative, hardcore Christian Republicans, and like you know, a lot of Florida people where I grew up, and I mm -hmm. started out in the Southern Circuit, so I moved to San Francisco. Because I wanted to be around gays and um, you know I still ethnicities, do. I still and, do. and uh, as do I. And but he's from Brooklyn, so he was around a little more diverse. You guys, a... you guys really make it hard to tell a story. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> this is how we do it. This is this is Eddie's. Yeah, that's this is true. the style. So of... uh, you know, so so when I went to Amsterdam, I thought that it was San Francisco times a thousand that the way San Francisco talks about being progressive and things like that, that, you know, it's still, uh, it, it's just, it, things are not put into action the way they should be. And now it's, you know, San Francisco's changed dramatically. But the Dutch are progressive people. They're very much, um, they have a history of bringing war-torn immigrants to the, to the Netherlands, uh, which is great. I mean, you'll meet people from Iraq and Syria everywhere. Uh, and Amsterdam is like a is like New York City if it was a small little village. You meet people from every corner of the world. Their their political system is is really interesting because it is a socialist democracy with a functioning monarchy. Wrap your brain around that. That the the, is the, the royal a puppet the kind of royal thing? family has political say wow. in their system. And it's a socialist democracy. And here's the mind-blowing thing that I have tried to explain to my family endlessly. There are three Christian parties in the Netherlands. You have 16 different political parties. I think our two-party system is completely wrong. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's all corporate run and lobbyists. And it's, it's, our system is so fucked. It's all money. It's all money. And it doesn't represent. Well, look at look at our country. It's 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 on the verge of a civil war. It is, and then now it's uh, it's run by uh, Putin and the Russians. And but we got a soccer ball. <laughs> anyway, so let me finish the point that yeah. the there's three Christian parties in the Netherlands. You have the Christian Right Party, which would be kind of like you know our Republicans, okay. and then you have the Christian Left, which is the left wing. Um, kind of liberal-minded Christians. Imagine there being more than one flavor Christian. And then here you go. You've got the Christian Green Left Party. And these are the environmentally-minded Christians Love who are so left-wing, they think the Christian left is too far right for them. I love it. And the left here is non-existent. Yeah. Well, actually, in no well, I don't. It's the only thing. It's up to the left now. Where is the Republican outcry over what's happening? Like Trump said that the, the European Union is is our foe. Uh, oh. A week ago, he said Canada is our foe, and now North Korea and Russia are our our allies. I'll tell you why these motherfucking the Republic. I'm going to tell you why. Lay it on me. Because they tolerate this administration because they make a fucking windfall this tax cut that went through yeah. because of these right-wing scumbags they 
fucking benefit greatly. And so they tolerate this guy. But, 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 yes, when he is now making enemies of quote unquote our allies. Yeah, for sure. And, yeah, I mean, I'm sure they're like going, what are you fucking but, doing? But, I, but, this but, trade but, but the, war? the this absolute trade war? Yeah, unnecessary trade war. That's and right. like and there's no outcry at the moment of people well, he saying, hijacked the party. He, the the far right hijacked the Republican that's party. Right. So in order for the Democratic party to s- exist and survive, they're going to have to move to the far left. That's and they're what's not. Gonna they're assholes. No, because they're fucking Republicans who like gay people. That's right. That's what they that's are. They're right. fucking that's solar great panels. Way to put the Democrats. Good point. Yeah. That's what they are. Yeah. And Bernie Sanders but, gave him a chance. He gave him a chance, and they fucked him. So now we're stuck with, and we'll see what they do if they roll out mm-hmm. more of these, these corporate fucking Democrats yeah. to go against uh, Trump. They're gonna it, listen. The corporate media and the, the corporatocracy don't want us to know there's more than two blue and red team. But really, there's mm-hmm. a lot of different but kinds of great, people what in Tom America. Was talking about what, Just, what, and I think what's great is that you have lived all over the world correct Mm -hmm. I think it's great to have that perspective and even me I mean I don't even have a good like it's just great to hear that there are three Christian parties and that there's a left of a left party there's a left of a left Christian party and I mean and then you and then there's all those other um, you know progressive parties there as well as the right wing and it's just there, there's like 16 different parties because there are many different flavors of political opinion. And somehow, and, and it's, uh, it's a socialist country. My wife is from Rotterdam, uh, which is the most ethnically diverse uh, never been city in Europe. And mm-hmm. it's kind of where a lot of their dark-skinned immigrants are sent. And uh, Rotterdam was obliterated in World War II, so it's a very modern city. Uh, where once upon right. a time it looked identical to Amsterdam. So my wife uh, is not from a wealthy family, and she got mm-hmm. to go to Leiden University, which is the Harvard of the Netherlands, and uh, it, she didn't have a student loan. It was a very reasonable um, uh, tuition that she paid, like doable. And here's the beautiful thing about the Netherlands. A week ago, because my wife reads the Dutch news. Uh, that's where her, her primary news source is uh, the Dutch uh, news sites and everything. So I hear her cheer in the, in the living room and I'm in the next room. I go, what's up, babe? What, what happened? She said, the Netherlands just lowered the price of education for every citizen. Recently? So no, last week. So not only was it affordable, I forget what she paid like a year. If it was like, to go to the best university, it's where the royal family of the Netherlands goes, is light. It's affordable to anybody. It's affordable to anybody. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you have to have grades and things like that, but you can get into any university. Wait a minute. I think it You co- have to have grades? What kind of <laughs> bastards are they? <laughs> so, I, I don't know what, what, she, what she paid, but it was reasonable. And then also, every citizen has basic health care. They're covered. And uh, just these... I mean, it, it's all about the sanctity of, of human life and uh, making the best possible citizens, which is the opposite of us, where we think, you know, the dumber you are, the better you serve capitalism. And let's divide everybody. Let's cut up the, the, the fucking voting districts so that, you know, the, the poor people and the blacks, their votes don't count. Oh, absolutely. Now, I, have a, I, I think I have a good question. We don't, get, we don't get the day off to vote, but we get President's Day off. That's what kills me about that's the United really States. That's really funny. Do you say that? That's I, I, it's, I've, 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 I've mentioned it on stage a few times. But, like, yeah. the most important day, the day we vote for president, is a Tuesday when, like, everyone has to work and poor people can't get that day off to go vote. And, and yet we get president's day off. So What's worse, they get off and the polls are still open, but they get there mm-hmm. and they're standing in a three-hour line and then it closes. And that shit happens all oh, the yeah. time. And, and, and poor people being purged from roles. Oh, well, that's... From don't voter don't roles, get blah, me blah, blah. fucking but started on that. Here's a question. After hearing all this, why the fuck are you living here? Are you a citizen of... of no, 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 no. Ah, but yeah. I, I, but I'm, I married a Dutch woman. I mean, so you, you could know, live there. Well, you know, I didn't... So I could, yeah. And I, I, I would like to um, end up I don't, I, you know, I, I, I love Europe, but I, uh, 
I I wanted to make my mark in my own country. I understand. And I that. love California. Yeah. And my wife loves California. Oh, she does. And uh, so she's really the reason that we moved here, which actually turned out to be great timing because it is uh, the golden age renaissance of comedy in Los Angeles right now. You know, uh, there's just kind of taking place at the comedy store or uh, all, yeah, over. all over. But I, mm-hmm. I think primarily at the comedy store. I mean, every yeah. night is like, I mean, Chris Rock did a set last yeah, night. Chappelle when he's in town, Bill Burr when he's in town every night, uh, Stan Hope. Uh, yeah, I you missed know. Stanhope. Stanhope was last fucking week, and I at the missed store. Him. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, I wasn't around. But it's like everything. Right. We Joe were, Rogan, we Joey Diaz, Eddie Pepitone. Yeah, that's uh, true. Pat Oswalt has been doing yeah. sets there recently. Yeah, it it's is just amazing. The, the best I take, of the best I of American comedy. I take it for granted. So, uh, so it's really great for me because I moved here three years ago. I had everything in storage for 10 years. Oh, yeah, he was telling me. So it was really interesting to get everything out of storage and see what I've been holding on to for all these years. That's where, <laughs> that's where I found, like, you know, Malcolm X cassette tapes <laughs> and shit, you know, from my, uh, my uh, you know, past underground. Um, but it, it's inspiring because, you know, you go to the comedy store and it's like, you know, you got to... You got, you know, it's, it's not just pleasing the audience. You want to impress the comedians that are there. So, you know, you can't do the same shit all the time. And then you got you to gotta be bringing some high level intelligent thoughts. You know, not everybody takes that approach, but, you know, <laughs> you know but, I, but, I, but I really, I love you it. You got that right, uh, buddy. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I know. Um, yeah, I was just telling Steve that last night um, I had an off set. I was in the original room and... I just, for me, the way I hook in, and I think you do this too, because you transform on stage. I have to have a certain energy. And I think you you are like that too. You go, bam, you have a kind of, well, let me tell you, have a, what's your stage voice? Can you do it now? I mean, I just, uh, I don't know. It, it's, it, it just, transforms. It's Tom different than a, this. It's different than this. It is. I, I mean, he probably know. wouldn't know it, but it's like, you kind of, you kind of talk like. Uh, like a black Southern preacher. Yes. I like yes. to elongate the syllables and hit the consonants. Oh, shit. Well, you were friends with Mitch, weren't you? I was friends with Mitch. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Did I he was influence all... you or you influence each other? Because uh, he started out in Florida too. No, nah, he was. No. I, they, I, was no. I was already in San Francisco when he oh, started. Oh, I see. And, okay, okay. Yeah, and uh, you know, Mitch was a good friend. I, uh, Mitch Hedberg, we're talking about, by the way, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Funny, funny, funny man. Brilliant guy. Mm. Yeah, I got to open up for him in uh, Bur- uh, Birmingham at the Stardome wow. when I first started. That was uh, only been a couple years, and I got high with Mitch. Not, not anything, any kind of hard drugs. But I got high with Mitch, and I did a week of stand-up with him, and he was like, L.A. is okay, man. It's not too bad. You know, people give it a bad rap. I like sushi. <laughs> <laughs> I like uh, sushi. I ended up coming here, partly because of that. So, But I, I started in Florida in college. Where? And uh, I started with, like, Bob Shoemaker at the Coconut. This is back when you had to go, you know, 90 miles to do an open mic. Yeah, everybody started Between, with Bob Shoemaker you know, in Florida. Yeah, <laughs> is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and he never paid any money. No, even <laughs> back then. Was, <laughs> and then he still doesn't pay any money. And then uh, oh, shit. I was home. I always go home at Christmas. My family's in Orlando. Oh, that's and really then fun. some of my best friends, um, you might know, Lou Angel Wolf and Kevin, my, Kevin Rogers. One of my best friends. In uh, my oldest best friends in the world. So I went. I always slip over and visit them over in Tampa, Clearwater, St. Pete area. And... Uh, Bob, I was down there visiting them and it just happened to be the night that Bob Shoemaker was having his annual Christmas party. And he has a very lovely home on the water and uh, with a little boat. He invites all his important friends. So, but it's funny that, oh, that's where the money went. The guy never paid any money to anybody. And then it's like, oh, of oh. course he has a beautiful home yes. right on the water. Yes. Uh, so, Tom, we have to take a break uh, and then do okay. an ad. We have... um. We have a lot of great sponsors, and we have a couple of new ones uh, this week. And I think you got Tom Rhodes Radio Smart Camp. Oh, I'm so, oh, I should have. We can. I you should want to pro- promo some stuff? No, I could give you a couple bucks, and we could make it a commercial. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Rhodes Radio Smart Camp sounds funny, but uh, we have a new sponsor this week, and uh, as you know, we uh, Matt Rossomoto. Oh. 
uh, the write, great. He the writes great these, Russell. but they are real, <laughs> real commercials. And this one is called Scream, Scream Cream Ice Cream Sandwiches. It's been a hot week in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. and there, and it really has been, hasn't it, Tom? Man, wow. Uh, Steve, hot? Hotter than a duck's ass. I don't know what that means. And you know, you know what I crave the most at this? Uh, doing you, these ice cream. Yeah, and that's our, our sponsor. It's funny you say that. It's funny you say that. I mean, it's not, I, I mean, it's I'm, not I'm, that funny. I'm speaking sincerely. It's ironic. I, I, I killed a, a pint of chocolate chip last night. Yeah, I got to watch it, though, because my doctor says I really have to watch the sugars. But you, you know when... He didn't mean in summer, though, did he? I don't think he <laughs> meant summer. You know, thank you, Tom, for that. By the way, I am so... I'm such a justifier or rationalizer that I will think that thought that Tom Rhodes said. Tom Rhodes said it okay. You got to have a root beer (laughs) float in the summer. Wouldn't that be funny if your doctor's like, look, you got to watch. You might be pre-diabetic. Summer is fine. Eat as much ice cream as you want. (laughs) Matter of fact, is grab some gummy bears on your way out. Anyway, screen. This is uh, an ad, and uh, thanks, Tom Rhodes, uh, for coming. Scream cream mm. ice cream sandwiches. It's been a hot week in Los Angeles, and there is no other way to beat the heat than with a delicious ice cream sandwich. Scream cream is world famous for its delicious ice cream sandwiches. In fact, some say these ice cream sandwiches are too good to be true, as explored in the new Netflix the new Netflix documentary series Scream Makers, which takes you behind the scenes of the dark world of ice cream sandwich manufacturing. From the vanilla cartels of Guatemala to the blood chocolate of the Ivory Coast, this document, this documentary, this is, this document, you're on documentary. Your own, dude. Jesus Christ. This documentary takes you behind the gory curtain of the most delectable summer treat in what TV Guide calls the most violent and horrific expose ever to be televised. Did you know that ice cream has this kind of background? I'm, I may want to give up ice cream after I see this. <laughs> That's a sc- I don't think you want to <clears throat> take it that far. It's delicious. <laughs> but I, he, I didn't. I didn't know people were being killed in Guatemala and yeah. the Ivory Coast. Yeah, but I still eat it. Yeah, why does, um, and he's a vegan. <laughs> why does Netflix do this to me? I, I can't. I'm, I'm keeping money in, sorry, in my Tom. mattress I'm because sorry, of Tom. what I learned about the banking system. All these Netflix documentaries are turning me away. They're from really everything. taking a lot of fun out of your life. Yeah. Well. Maybe you should just ignore this one okay. and enjoy your ice cream. But anyway, la, 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 in, in la, the la, summertime. La, 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 la. <laughs> right. <laughs> filmed over five years. They filmed wow. over five years. Dedicated filmmakers, these documentary, uh, these documentary filmmakers, aren't they? <laughs> I, it's in the aren't you, they dedicated, Steve? I'm not sure, but, I, but maybe. I think they are. They, they, dress, they dress very... It's not a documentary. It is, you <laughs> asshole. It's filmed over five years. Screen Makers captures not only the mind curdling terror of ice cream sandwich production, but captures the barbaric, trapping, and torturous deaths of the documentary crew themselves. Netflix's Lisa, Netflix's Lisa Nishimura says, the bloody videotapes were mailed to us by the very people who committed the atrocities. This is not a doc. See what I said? This is not a, a, a documentary. This is a warning. And what better way to watch that morning than with a delicious scream cream ice cream sandwich? Oh boy, are they good. Wow. Now let me let me read so that because anyway, I think folks, I could do better. I think the message here is yes, people are getting murdered in the production of these ice cream sandwiches. However, enjoy it with an ice cream sandwich. I'm afraid I might give up ice cream after seeing it. I mean, I was going to join a cult in Oregon, and then Netflix just just killed that for me. Oh yeah, you know? so it's I think like, you got to follow your I gotta, heart. I think I might got to get rid of Netflix. That's it. Maybe you should that's get it. rid of Netflix. Just, yeah, you know, but also follow your heart. What, you, what were you going to say? Just get rid of your conscience. That's all you got. to Oh do. wow. That's... Oh, then I would be American or re- <laughs> Republican. Um, I also, we also, Tom, we get calls um, from people um, each week. And we have a call. I think we had just one this week. And remember, if you want to leave a comment to me and Steve or one of our guests, the number is 424-262-0904. That's 424-262-0904. And we have a, uh, we have a, uh, we have a call here. And, I, and uh, let's, listen. let's listen to this call. Hey, Eddie, Eddie Bonet. It's your boy, Jardo. Um, so I've just been doing 
doing some philosophical thinking here. I was watching uh, the other night, um, Stand By Me, great film. I hate to spoil it here, but I kind of need to for the point I'm trying to make. There's, at the climax of the film, you know, Kiefer Sutherland's character has a knife to River Phoenix in his neck. And then later on, they say that he died years later as an adult trying to break up a fight and to get stabbed in the neck. And I read somewhere online, someone said that was foreshadowing his death which is kind of an interesting idea that the universe kind of foreshadows your death. But in kind of a logical way, a non-mystical way, I mean, that happens all the time anyway. You know, um, for instance, <clears throat> my grandmother had colorectal cancer for seven years. And you know what? That's eventually what killed her. So in a weird way, I mean, everyone probably has enough access to information to realize that they're going to die of a certain thing. Unless it's a random thing, but if it's a progressive disease, I say, you know, you're going to have kind of an idea that's how you go out. So I guess this relates more to like an Aji question too, because I know he's of the Jewish faith. I was kind of curious if, if this concept is within your religion, is the idea that the concept of God is so powerful and mystical that he doesn't even have to exist. Is that is that concept anywhere in, in the religion? I'm actually genuinely curious about that, like an idea that's so powerful that theoretically it doesn't even have to exist to be useful, you know, it doesn't have, I mean, it could be both things, you know, kind of like, you know, light's a particle and a wave, you know, it can, you know, be a real thing, but also just a construct of our imaginations. Mm -hmm. I was just curious if, like, rabbis ever talk about that. So, uh, hope that's a good question, and you guys take care. Bye. Huh. Well, that was an interesting phone call because he went from Stand By Me to the universe foreshadowing your death. And, uh, and then is God and then, so uh, powerful? Does He even need to exist? And do Jews believe it? So what? Uh, you're our uh, no. I Jewish don't think expert. so. First of all, that was the longest call we ever had. Yes, I got an interesting call. That. Interesting call. Totally, totally. He referenced Keith, Kiefer Sutherland. Kiefer Sutherland, Sutherland, Sutherland knife River, to River do you, Phoenix. Do you know anything about this, Tom? River Phoenix. I and I don't remember. Stand by me. I don't that, remember. That wasn't in. Was River, River Phoenix in Stand by Me? Yeah, yeah. He was the kid. So I remember vaguely he has the knife to his throat. Yeah, he's not lying about that. Yeah. Or, or Mr. My favorite scene is when uh, they go to the junkyard and the, the, you realize the one kid's dad was crazy and, and the guy goes, loony, 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 loony. I don't the remember kid, that. The kid gets all pissed off and he's trying to climb the fence and they pull I got to rewatch that. Does that hold up? Yeah. By Great me? It's film, good. Yeah. Great film. But I haven't seen Stephen it. Stephen King wrote that. It's I know. Amazing. Stephen King wrote that. Yeah, yeah. Really? I haven't seen that in years. So uh, but go ahead. So talked about God, what he said uh, at the end, Gardo, thanks, Gardo, for the call. He called me Eddie Pony, which is hilarious. I must have mentioned that on a podcast. That was the nickname <coughs> my grandmother gave me. Eddie Pony. I'm a Sicilian. <laughs> Eddie Pony. She used to call me Eddie Pony because I used to be on a rocking horse, a pony rocking horse. Yeah. And this isn't to brag. See, this see isn't to brag. About. I, I know that you folks, your lives, I, I think they're barren, but it's, I was on a and rock dying carpet on store. The vine. <laughs> dying on the vine. In your carpet store and your cubicle drooling on your desk. <laughs> now you can't eat ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I used to be on a rocking horse all the time, a little pony, and she used to call me Eddie Pony. That's adorable. Isn't it? You need a, I, she was the I one. I think that would probably... Bring you what the Malcolm X tapes do for me. Yeah, Maybe you need right. a no, that adult was his, size rocking. Pump. That was Thomas. his nurturing symbol in his life. Nurturing female. Yeah, was your my grandmother, grandmother, right? Yeah, absolutely, my Italian grandmother. But uh, you want to answer this question about God? Like the concept. In other words, it, the concept itself is so powerful that he doesn't even have to bother showing up. Is that true? Oh, well, you would think, I mean, if God is all powerful, you know, why do we have to bother him with praying? I mean, if, if God knows every, every hair the on your head. praying is for us. I, I think Jim Morrison said. Uh, what did Morrison petition, say? You cannot yeah. petition the Lord with prayer. But, you know, he was a fucking moron. Yeah, he was a moron. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was, you know, he was a heavy duty uh, alcoholic. I was really into Morrison when I was younger. Me too. When I, uh, really? You read, a, you read any of that poetry now, it's like, oh, my God. Is it horrible? He's just a pretentious oh, asshole, kind of. Kind of. I mean, you know, I like, I, 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 there's, there's still a handful of Doors songs I like. But now I've been to, uh, I'm a big Francophile, and I've, I've been to France, Paris many times, and I used to always have to go to Morrison's grave, man. Really? But uh, he's in Père Lachaise Cemetery, and there's so many cooler graves there. 
Oscar Wilde is buried there. Uh, Chopin. Uh, Sylvia Plath? Uh, no, uh, no, Edith Piaf is there. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, I was always more into uh, Dylan. Dylan uh, Marcel yours. Proust is there. Um, wow. You know. Wow. It's pretty awesome. I was always more into Dylan, even in college. When I was a young kid, I was Good like Dylan love... more than. What's your favorite Dylan song? God, tough. that's a tough. Tomorrow one. is a long time. Probably the grains of that's sand, what? the every grain of sand. Have you heard that one? Every grain of sand. Mm. It's one of and during his religious, he was doing that religious. The three period. religious records, yeah, are great. which are yeah. amazing, which are great. Lenny Bruce is dead. Yeah, you, you got to serve, serve somebody. somebody. Great song. It could be a banker, <laughs> a lawyer, or a cop. It could be a carpet store, linoleum, or not. <laughs> <laughs> linoleum or not. Um, you said you love Europe. Other favorite places besides Amsterdam. Uh, Amsterdam is amazing, and I need to give you some tips on yes, Amsterdam please before do. we wrap up on, please do. Uh, <clears throat> on the podcast. But um, other favorite places? Paris. I'm a big Paris Man, I go freak. Paris so uh, I love everything about um, Paris and, and, and French culture. And um, I just put out an episode, uh, the podcast episode I put out today is on... Uh, it's called Theater of the Absurd, but it's actually about the avant-garde movement of 1885 to World War One, uh, which uh, the painter Henry Rousseau, which I, I never liked him, but reading this book, The Banquet Years, made me like they, they People li disliked his painting so much they slashed him with knives when he first uh, portrayed him. But there's this, this guy who uh, named Alfred Jari, and he, he, did, he did this famous play called Ubu Roy, and Roy is mm -hmm. king, so it would be King Ro uh, Ubu in our translation. So uh, I played this theater in Paris in January called Theater La Ouvre, and that's where this play happened, which made me want to read about it. So uh, they had no sets because the dialogue is the decor, and the opening line of the play is mad shit. And there was a near 15 minute riot. They had to turn on the, the, the house lights and- Profanity was- the, the People taboo? didn't say shit in, in public back then. And, uh, and he was a really interesting guy. He, he stayed drunk uh, <laughs> on absinthe. Uh, later in his life, it was ether when he was poor, but he was trying to blend the reality between um, um, uh, being wasted, being making, turning his life into a dreamlike state was what he was trying to do. On canvas? Uh, no, no, no. This is the, oh, playwright, the playwright guy, the playwright. who was friends with gotcha. with Rousseau. They real. were from the same little town, right. and, uh, and and this this play Ubu Roy kind of transformed. Uh, it was really uh, the it was this 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 kind of character was kind of like between a, a, a child prodigy and a brat. And so it is really funny sense of humor where like nothing was taken seriously and everything was to be ridiculed. A really interesting guy and it influenced everybody. Picasso imitated the guy. The bicycle was a new invention. So this guy used to drive his bicycle around Paris with a rifle over his shoulder and two pistols in his belt. What's his name again? Alfred Jari. Oh, Jari. Have you ever heard of Jari? I, I know the name, but yeah. I don't know yeah, his yeah. So my So the episode of my podcast I just put out today What's the name was, of your podcast again? Uh, Tom Rhodes Radio Smart Camp. Okay. So I try to in, I try and uh, educate people. I did an episode on, uh, I did a three-part series on the French Revolution. Really great stuff, man. Uh, Danton, my favorite character from the French Revolution, when he gets sent to the uh, guillotine, he stepped up onto the scaffolding and he told the executioner, be sure to hold my head up for the people. It's well worth seeing. If you're going to get your head cut off, you got to say something. I hope cool. I go like that. I hope I go like that if I have the balls to do that because I think there's going to be bloodshed here. I think we're... Well, it's funny that the thing about the French Revolution is like, oh, well, could you imagine one political group hating another so much that ah! they would chop the heads off? Well, here it is. And here we are. So, uh, so yeah, there's... Uh, uh, interesting things to ponder. I did another episode on Mark Twain's worldwide comedy tour. Oh, he, now he did, I know a little bit. He about did after that. he declared bankruptcy, really, to get out of uh, out of debt. And and I think uh, Mark Twain uh, invented modern stand up comedy. When was that? When when that was eighteen nineties? 
Wow. Yeah, so yeah. it's around the same time as <laughs> Alfred Jarry put on that play in 1896. It predates vaudeville, that's for sure. Yeah. Wow. Will Twain, <clears throat> as Tom said, went bankrupt. He 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 had a kind of tragic life. He lost a couple of siblings. His brother died on a Mississippi River boat. He was supposed to be on the boat. And he got off, and then there was a fire, and his brother died. That was the first tragedy. And then um, he had a, uh, he was really, really bad with his investments. He invested in this typeset machine that broke him and all these other things. He had a chance to invest in the very first telephone. And he said, who would use it? Just oh me and the president. Gosh, so he could have made a fortune off the telephone, but he didn't. He didn't. So genius who was a fucking idiot. He was that's a, he the was a, greatest. Yeah. That's the greatest. So genius and then who was a fucking idiot. And then he Funny. had he had uh, I think he had three daughters and uh, Livy the most oldest one was the most popular and she was beautiful and guys liked her and then she had another daughter who was an epileptic and they kind of they tried all these different treatments they took her to Sweden they had money they could do what they, they they did all these things and nothing and it was all like you know terrible treatments like putting people under ice cold water and just uh, it, it was hellish and they're paying and it couldn't cure her and then she ended up dying while he was on this worldwide comedy tour so um, the, the guy's life was full of full of tragedy full of tragedy and it is amazing that uh, you know he's one of the is, is he considered America's He's considered a humorist, that's for sure. One well, the, 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 the best comedy author. award is, is the, the Mark, Mark Twain yeah, Award. Yeah, oh, right. I didn't even, I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And like Tom said, he's kind of the first stand up comedy. He invented stand up comedy. Out of I necessity, he had to go yeah. around the country. He actually right. hated performing. But the thing about him was he would, he would hone it like a stand up comedian. So he would run the material. And then he would drop lines that didn't work. He was constantly like trying to punch it up and make it better. And the, 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 this book that I read about his worldwide comedy tour that I did the, the podcast about, uh, his wife actually told him, do the story about, from Tom Sawyer, about when he's with the runaway slave on the boat. And he, they stop and the, 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 the gym is hiding in, in the bushes and, and they're, they, all these guys are looking for a runaway gym and he says that he doesn't see him or all this stuff and he lies but his con cuz you know and he, it's this conflicted moment for for Tom Sawyer where he's like he doesn't have anything against the woman who owns the slave and you know and you know why was he doing this but he felt that it was the right thing to do so that was the story that made everyone's heart melt from Australia to India to England and Paris and everywhere they went. Mm -hmm. And it was his wife who told him, make sure you tell that fucking story in the middle. Jesus. Cut out that. Yeah, yeah. You got to listen to a wife, man. Yeah, my wife. My wife Mickey, helps me my, my stand up too. Walt Disney originally wanted to call Mickey Mouse Mortimer Mouse. <laughs> and, and his wife said, no, that's fucking stupid. So the wife is the wives are so integrally involved in. Well, they also know you so well and they have enough distance from the material like I can't see. <clears throat> I yeah. can't see things clearly because of, you know, you know, it's you're so involved in your shit that you're like. And but they know it. They know you. They know the material. And uh, this is a good time for an ad. Um, that would be Twain. great. I think I think Mark Twain invented stand-up comedy as we know it. Uh, I, I I think Oscar Wilde is also in there, but he didn't give mm. live performances. He was hilarious with the lines and with the company, thoughts and yeah. with company, right? Yeah, but that's but he different. didn't he didn't actually do it on a stage. So that's why I think Mark Twain is. Well, you know what, Mark Twain and who else did you mention? Mark Twain, Oscar Wilde, Oscar Wilde, and now I'd like to talk about another guy who's incredible. The Lost Book of L. Ron Hubbard. That's right. Scientology has had a lot of criticism throughout the years, and I'm not going to say it isn't deserved, Florida, right? But The Lost Book of L. Ron Hubbard <laughs> is a masterpiece. The New York Times calls it the most important book of our age. Get your copy of L. Ron Hubbard's Definitive Guide to Proper Dishwasher Loading and Maintenance today. The Definitive Guide covers everything from top, top rack stacking to tandem bowl lineup. Did you know that the fork up versus fork down argument is the number three cause of divorce in America? Probably didn't. Scientology chairman David Miscavige says, I finally understand all that bullshit about going clear. It was about spots. 
It was always about spots. <laughs> well, Macbeth, Macbeth was about spots, wasn't it? Out damn spot. I don't know, but or spot, come here. That's a that's what I said. Didn't he say out vile jelly? Wasn't that what he said? No, that's a porn. The Wall Street Journal says the bit on pre-washing my new mind and sweet holy fuck. Did you read the chapter on lemon juice? Pat Robertson, Christian evangelical, says you would think if Jesus were really the Son of God, he would have covered. Pods and powders. I feel as if my whole life was a sham. Order L. Ron Hubbard's Definitive Guide to Proper Dishwasher Loading and Maintenance, the most pivotal book in all of human history. I can't yeah. believe you guys have Scientology commercials, man. That's yeah, our first uh, one. Uh, well, we, That's our first. We're, we're getting we're endorsed. I, I've, only had a, I've only had a couple uh, commercials on my podcast. Maybe I need to, I don't know. Yeah, you need I need to. I need to get rid of the the uh, the intelligence content. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I like what you're doing. That sounds awesome. I mean, yeah, because, I love you know, that you're doing. Because when I was I was traveling around the world, you know, I didn't live anywhere for ten years. Put everything in storage. Traveled the world for ten years, and my podcast then was I was interviewing people, mostly comedians around the world. You know, as I traveled and uh, did a lot of great people. Uh, but I mean, I, I did like Steve Wozniak. Uh, I, I did Kim.com when I was in New Zealand. I did a lot of great um, worldwide comedians. And then when I moved to L.A., I thought, you know, every comedian in L.A. is talking to other comedians. So um, let me just talk about things that I'm really interested in. That's cool. So, like, when I'm, um, you know, I'm constantly reading books and I'm uh, all about the knowledge. So try yeah. to... Try I to... love that. I mean, I love just hearing about... Because I love... I can't believe I haven't been to Paris yet. I and, can't believe you haven't either. And my favorite author in the whole world is was born in Brooklyn. He was born in Brooklyn. His name is Henry Miller. Henry Miller, come on now. I love Henry Miller. Yeah, okay, me too. And most people think of Miller, mm -hmm. oh, sex. All they think about is, oh, he wrote a lot about sex because his Tropic of Cancer yeah. got banned. Oh, yeah. Well, the you know, I like my favorite Henry Miller, and I am a Henry Miller freak. I'm you so are. Glad I didn't you, know I'm that, I'm so buddy. glad you bring well, this up. Well, we're simpatico, baby. Yeah. I, my favorite Henry Miller... And I, and I tell people, don't don't start with Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of uh, Capricorn. Uh, the uh, Rosy Crucifixion trilogy. Oh, I love the Rosy Nexus, Crucifixion. Sexus, and Plexus. And of those, Sexus is my favorite. And he does talk about what he did with his dick for 10 pages. Yes. But then he'll drop the most, boom, uh, the, the most profound observations of human existence. Uh, after he talks about his dick for 10... It's not well, exaggerating. Well, you have to talk about your dick for but, 10 but minutes in order in to Paris get that out of the way. He's in Paris in the 20s, and he wasn't... Um uh, You know, he, he wasn't making any money, and he, he had, right. like... He had friends every night of the week that would feed him dinner. So wow. he would go... So he had a schedule every night, like, Tuesday, I'm going to... Eddie's he had a dinner. hustle. He, he, he didn't have money, and... I love him because he is... First of all, he's from Brooklyn. I'm from Brooklyn, and he he fucking scrapped his way to being an unbelievable author. And like Tom said, he would, you know, he got known for kind of like sexual, like he was very explicit with his, you know, sexual dalliances. But then he would just talk incredibly philosophically or insightfully about the world, the universe. It, it was just fucking great. One of my favorite writers of all time. And then um, The Colossus of Marusi mm. is one of my favorite books, which is about this period he spent in Greece. Um, Have you been to Greece? I've been to Greece many times, yeah. I've been to the island of Rhodes because it's got my fucking name. <laughs> <on>. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I swam naked at the entrance of Rhodes Harbor where the Colossus of Rhodes once stood. So when I lived in Amsterdam, when I lived in Amsterdam for those five years, I would try and take as many trips around Europe as I could. Like Spain is two hour flight to take the train to Paris is only three hours. So, uh, so, so Greece is a three hour flight from Amsterdam. Mm. And, uh, I've been to Santorini, Mykonos, been to Athens. I hear Mykonos but, is amazing. It's nice. I, I prefer, I, I like Santorini better. The, this, this, this little town on top of the hill is called Ia, and you've seen it a million times in postcards where it's this this on top of a mountain and it's all these like white domes and blue domed 
oh, yeah. things, and you can see the sea in the mm-hmm, distance. Mm-hmm. That's Ia. It's this famous postcard shot. But uh, the island of Rhodes is supposed to be the Florida of Europe, but I'm from Florida. I don't have a problem with Florida. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I, I think the island of Rhodes is amazing. It's a fortress city uh, built 300 years before Christ. The oldest synagogue in Europe is in wow. within the uh, fortress. It's an amazing place. He talked about great. You don't know Miller, right? You don't know Henry Miller. No, you don't I, know I read novel. the I read the Tropic of Cancer, oh, okay. and I and I know he was married to Anais Nin. Right? No, they, they weren't were married. Or? They were just fucking. They were fucking. They were yeah. fucking, and she yeah. was a total literary. She was married she to was, another guy. Right. Wow. Yeah. And right. she was crazy. I mean, she was a wild sex. She wasn't crazy. She was a super intelligent she woman. She was wild. Who was, yeah. uh, who, you know, that's the, the luxury of people living in Paris in the 20s. That she could be, she could be free sexually and not mm-hmm. be ostracized for it, like women who were in the United States at that period. Mm-hmm. And then, like, the way Henry Miller, I wouldn't say he was a mentor. I would say he was more of an equal. And that was the, the attraction between them was because... You know, he was fucking his brains out, which was cool because he was a bald guy. I you love know? that. The fact that he was a bald, bald guy from guy. Brooklyn. Yeah. Bald guys from Brooklyn. And uh, he I'm felt he felt free. that she was his intellectual equal. And she was super smart. I feel bad for her husband, but uh, but she she wasn't there wasn't anything wrong with what she was doing. She just she wrote freely like Henry oh, Dillard. Great. Like it's other great. men did. What great was her stuff. famous book I read? The House of Little Birds. Was it Little Birds? Mm, yeah. Poetry. You know the book I'm talking about? No. Okay. Uh, Anais Nin, House of... Maybe Little Birds. I don't know. Uh, not the poetry. It was just Short erotica. Short stories. Short stories. It, was, it yes. was erotica. And it, and it was the first time like I read erotica. You know? And I read it out loud to... <laughs> the, the New York subway. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to I now have you. Like <laughs> did you put a hat? Out? <laughs> did you put great. a hat out for money? Yeah, of course. It filled that I motherfucker. Didn't I'm so glad you like Henry Miller. That makes me so. Dude, happy. I that's my all time one of my all time favorites. Ah, uh, my all time. favorite. You should you should come you should come by my apartment and see the um, the uh, my Henry Miller shelf. We have to wrap up. Tell me. Oh my give god! Me a okay. couple of tips. I gotta about give Amsterdam. you. Okay, Amsterdam. All right. So you're gonna be staying. Uh, right across the street from Tumler. <clears throat> so the Amsterdam Hilton uh, is where John Lennon and Yoko Ono did the Love Inn in 1969. Uh, ah. It's also where uh, Herman Brood committed suicide by jumping off. Herman Brood was the Lou Reed of Dutch music. He was like Love a it. Lou punk Reed, rock my favorite cool musician. Dude. I, and one of mine as well. Uh, so where that is, uh, when you come out of there, you're going to be staying. I think it's called the Bilderberg Hotel where you'll be staying. And um, you walk, from there, you, you can walk straight. It's like three blocks straight over to Vondel Park. And you come out. Oh, I've been to Vondel. You yeah. come out right in the center. And that Vondel Park in summer it's is so the nice. best place in Amsterdam. It is cool. And it's just so great. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's the, the weather's bad there for eight months out of the year. So is it? it's rainy and cold for most of the year. Yeah. So in the summer. That's why your wife loves California. Perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps, but, Tom? Uh, <clears throat> there's, a, there's, there's a Japanese tea garden where you can have tea in there. But it's, it's such a great place. I would recommend <laughs> getting, renting a bicycle. And, and, and riding around Vondel Park. But then very close to there is uh, Museum Plein. Uh, in, in, in Holland, a Plein is a square. So you have, it's Museum Square. Uh, there's the Van Gogh Museum, and then there's the Rijks Museum where they have all the Golden Age Dutch masters paintings like Rembrandt's yeah. Night Watch. Yeah, yeah. But so you can ride your bike from where you're at, staying there uh, around Vondel Park or over to Museum Plein, and then through the bottom of the Rijks Museum is a tunnel for bicycles. And you can ride your bike straight through this tunnel of the Rijks Museum, and then you come out straight onto Spiegelstraat if you keep going straight. And that is probably my favorite street in Amsterdam. Spiegelstraat. Spiegelstraat. And it's By the all... way, if you're listening from a carpet store, <laughs> <laughs> Spiegelstraat it's, uh, is equivalent to a really nice warehouse. It's ga- art galleries, and it's just, there's, there's a soup and zo, this place that has great, incredible soups, mm. and uh, it's w- one of the, my biggest thrills to ride a bike 
through that tunnel and then you come out on Spiegelstraat and there's, and there's canals along the way and it's absolutely wonderful. See who is on at the Paradiso. The Paradiso is a 14th century church which is now a concert venue and nightclub. And nights when there's not concerts, uh, it's a pretty great dance club. And it's in a 14th century church. That must be the left wing Christian. Everybody has played there. Um, the green Christian. I saw Jane's Addiction there, India Ari, Tool, uh, the Rolling Stones have played there. It's wow. like it's this, and it's a short walk from where you're at. Awesome. Uh, so that's great. Uh, do not take the tourist boat tour of Amsterdam. Find a Dutch friend who will take you on their own little personal boat. And then you go to Albert Hein, which is the grocery store, and get some cheeses and some strawberries and some sparkling water or whatever you like. And uh, hopefully someone will like you enough to take you out onto the canals. Uh, there was one year when I was playing it. See, in the Amsterdam Hilton is right on this, this fabulous canal. And that's Amsterdam South, which is like kind of the wealthy area of Amsterdam. But um, the Dutch woman that I fell in love with when I, uh, when I moved there, or, I'm sorry, before I moved there, when I, when I met her, one of the reasons I fell in love with her, she took me out on a boat for the afternoon with cheeses and strawberries and, you know, whatever. And we spent the day on the canals. And we were running late, and she took me straight to the backside of the Amsterdam Hilton uh, so I could make it to my show in time, which was really cool uh, to step off That's of a boat and then cool. go right to the thing. Uh, another thing you should check out, and it's another reason that made me fall in love with the Netherlands, is this thing, and it, if, you're, if your timing is right, it'll be on. And it's called the Parade, spelled like parade. I think the website would be parade.nl. And it's the most incredible thing. It's all these little tents, and, and the shows are all, there's these little performances going on in all these tents. They take over this park. Uh, and I think it's John F. Kennedy Plein where they do this in Amsterdam every year. But it, it tours all over the Netherlands, and it's one week in, in every city, in Groningen and Utrecht and Rotterdam. And it's one of my favorite things in the Netherlands, and it's so Dutch. What's it called again? <clears throat> it's called the, the Parade. Okay. It's called the Parade. Mm -hmm. So parade.nl, or just Google Parade uh, Holland. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's these wacky performances, and they only – so there's, you have outdoor bars and outdoor little food stands, but there's like, I would say, 30 to 50 little tents where you don't know what's going on in there. And you get like, you, you pay for like these tickets to go to the shows, and the tickets are only like 50 cents each. And you can go into one, and it might be like the weirdest thing, some Dutch guy just smashing pies into his face or while riding a unicycle, or you could see like some really great, and these, these little performances are only like five or ten minutes long. Uh, but you never know what the performance is going to be. This is their comedy store showcases, basically. Basically. Yeah. And then it was the first time I had ever seen uh, uh, the, the, um, the silent disco where the people, everyone's got their own headphones oh, on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard now, of that. Now you see that at festivals everywhere. Right. But I saw it 20 years ago there. Mm -hmm. for the first time. That is pretty amazing. And, okay, let me tell you this. <clears throat> uh, um, one of my favorite things in Amsterdam is the Children's Museum. It's called the Tropen Museum. And you can take the number nine tram. It's out by the zoo. The zoo is pretty. Three o'clock is feeding time at the zoo. And if you're standing in front of the lions at three o'clock, it's pretty thrilling to watch the lions ripping raw meat apart with their teeth. Uh, that's actually where I was standing on September 11th, uh, when uh, wow, you know, that I was little, at a zoo. little symbolic, yeah. no? <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So, so the Trouble Museum is like a block from there, and it's a children's museum, but it's it's all about the mm -hmm. rest of the world, and this mm -hmm. is it's such a uh, it shows you the the Dutch Enlightenment and how progressive they are, where it's all about because they colonized people all over the world in in Indonesia and. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, and there's an art uh, photo exhibit, but it's this really cool uh, place about the rest of the world, and they're very honest about their history with the rest of the world. And the last tip I will give you, mm. which a lot of people don't know about, and I always tell people to do this, it's, it's in the red light district. The red light district is in the center of town, so there's no way to avoid it. 
Right. The Amsterdam is shaped like half a pizza. And so uh, they sealed off the ocean, but it used to be that the river there went to the ocean. So the Amstel. The, the, uh, no, it's called the Eye. Oh, I thought it was the Amstel. The Amstel is on the other side of town. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but this is the Eye, okay. which is behind Central Station, the train station. So the sailors would all come in there, and that's the red light district is the oldest part of town. Ah. There's a place there, and this is my tip. It's called the Church in the Attic. Mm. And so it's the oldest part of town. At one time in the Netherlands, Catholicism was illegal. These people built their own private Catholic church in their attic. And it's on the edge of the red light district. And uh, it's pretty amazing uh, whenever they did this, I don't know, 1500, something like that. But it, it's called, it just Google church in the attic, Amsterdam. I mean, and it's 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 and parade or parade. Yeah, and parade. I, I I I highly recommend those. If you were there in April, I would tell you to go to Kokonoff, which is where the the all the tulips are displayed. Mm. If you ever go, and that's a must. And you take the train to Leiden, and then uh, as you're taking the train, you, you just pass these fields where it's like. Uh, of tulips were like it's yellow tulip field, red tulip field, purple. So taking the train past all Sounds these like fields a of tulips, organic <laughs> mescaline yeah. trip. And then there's all these um, arrangements of 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 tulips at Kokonoff. It's pretty amazing. So amazing. Well, you know that's a great. What you just did is for anybody listening a great fucking Amsterdam. I think this ep- episode yeah. should be actually. <clears throat> Well, inside what, tips yeah, to Amsterdam yeah, because awesome. anybody who's going to visit um, there now. Okay, and can I tell you one one last yeah. uh, one last thing? It's not a tip, but uh, I I find the net. I th- I just I, I I love Dutch people. They're very progressive. They're, you you'll find yourself having intelligent conversations with everyone, and everyone is enlightened. You'll you very rarely will you meet just a absolute pinhead in the Netherlands, but <coughs> oh, have bitterballen. It's this bar treat. They have it at Tumler, every bar in the Netherlands. And it, it's, it's hard to describe, but it's, uh, it, it's fried gravy balls. <laughs> and you dip it in this, like, uh, Dijon hot mustard, and it's, it's orgasmic. They're really? so friggin' good. He's a vegan, though, so he might have some really? issues. Are you really? You could make an exception. Yeah, yeah. Well, they don't, they don't torture the animals the same in Europe <clears throat> right, as they right, do right. here. Oh, well, anyway. So, uh, but here's, here's, here's my, the, the, the last thing I wanted to tell you. Uh, I know so many things about, you know, and my late night talk show that I had in Amsterdam, I was a foreigner experiencing Dutch culture. So everything was taught to me. Everything was explained to me. And um, the, the, like, like there's this Dutch word called hazelic, and that describes all of Dutch culture. It's what they're looking for, and it's the way everything. Hazelic, they say, is there's no English equivalent for hazelic, but uh, I think it's bullshit. Uh, Hazelic is somewhere cozy that you're in no hurry to leave. Love that. And that is Dutch society is, oh, it's Hazelic. But here's the funny thing I wanted to tell you. Dutch people do this. And and then whenever I'm there, I I always uh, throw this out on stage whenever I can. But um, whenever a Dutch person is disappointed with something, they say, hey, las, pindakas. Which means? It's a Dutch expression, and they all say it when something bad happens or they're disappointed. And the literal translation is, it's a pity, peanut butter. <laughs> it's a pity, peanut butter. Peanut, peanut butter. butter. What the How fuck? Halos <laughs> Pindicas. Halos. You know what? You've convinced me. I'm moving back to the Netherlands. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. Man. Why I did know. I ever fucking leave? I'm telling you, I'm listening to this going, what the fuck am I doing? I loved it. I had a bike when I lived there. I had a number of bikes, but, uh, you know, just it's such a great, wonderful place. Well, thank you, Tom Rhodes. And I want to say um, a couple of things, and, and we want to promote uh, Tom's podcast, which is called what again, Tom? Tom Rhodes Radio Smart Camp. It's and, uh, everywhere. And obviously, that's a good listen. Um, so if you like pep talks... Be sure to rate and review us on iTunes. Or if you're watching us on Facebook and like what you see, tell a friend. If you listen to us on SoundCloud, I guess you can click the little heart icon. What is it, five seconds out of your day? It's just literally literally pressing a button. 
This commercial is about halfway in, so obviously you like this garbage or you wouldn't be hearing my voice right now. Okay, the iTunes thing is a bit more intensive. You have to decide how many stars to rate us. Quick hint, the number is all of them. And I know you feel like you're on the spot for something to say, so just smash the keyboard until you fill the page with letters. Who cares? Facebook user, those quote-unquote friends who are following you are all bots. So (laughs) asking them to watch a video isn't going to ruin the world. You might have to ask in Russian, but they'll eventually check it out. The more you rate our show, the more sponsors we get. It's not like Ruchi's and face bags comes from the ayahuasca-fueled fever dreams of an unemployed degenerate. All right, everybody. Steve, I, I, yeah, so I'll be at Tumler's um, August. Who are you doing Tumler with? I, I'm not sure. The guy uh, Stefan Pop, who runs it, is great. Yeah, I Wonderful know. guy. I know. Stefan is, yeah. is the guy who booked me, and I love Stefan. And uh, I um, will be there, um, the, uh, August. I think, 8, 9, 10, August. 11, in uh, Amsterdam, Tumler's. Um, then I'm going to be doing the Altercation Comedy Festival in Austin in September, September 27th. Um, you got any gigs you want to? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm going to be uh, in West Nyack, New York, mm. coming up. I think it's Levity Live, I think it's called. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm going to be in Addison, um, Texas, Dallas at the Improv. Uh, I'm going to be doing the – this is all in a few months from now. Um, Go to your website. Atlanta web- Punchline, TomRhodes.net. Uh, next month, I'm going to do uh, Shanghai, Beijing, and Mongolia. I'm going back to Mongolia. <laughs> I love Theo Vaughn, who I was just talking to, just came back from Shanghai. He loved it. Yeah, Shanghai is one of my, it's probably my favorite city in Asia. And then I did Mongolia last September, and it was already in the 30s. I loved it so much. I read Genghis Khan's biography before I went there. Is it Genghis? I thought it was Genghis. They pronounce it Genghis. They pronounce it Genghis. Yeah. So, um, uh, and I want to, I want to experience it in the summer. So, um, so yeah, actually, the week after you're in Tumor, I'll be in. Mongolia. Oh, cool. I was in the Mongolian uh, Chuckle Hut. And uh, I'm kidding. Mongolian ha <laughs> <laughs> What the fuck are the crowds like in Mongolia? Dude? They're all Mongolian. A lot of times you play, what when I play in Asia, like? it's like half the audience will be, you know, if you're in China, it'll be half Chinese and then half expats. Uh, in Japan, it's half Japanese, half. Um, I'm going back to Tokyo. But people in speak enough English, obviously. They all speak English. I mean, not all of them, but right. I mean, the the, the the comedy club sat a hundred people. It was the same size as Tumor, you know, um, and they were English speaking Mongolians, people who have been educated in other countries or whatever. And you just uh, do your material. Yeah, you know, I said I had great opening. I said uh, apparently everyone in the world is somehow related to Genghis Khan, so I'm just here to visit family. Hello, cousins, and uh, I and I, I said I read Genghis Khan's biography. Before I came here, and under the rule of Genghis Khan, no individual was ever held responsible for a mistake or an error. It was the community's fault as a whole. So if this show doesn't go good tonight, it's all of our <laughs> fault. All right, I'll tell you, and I'll tell you one more. This is uh, this is what I opened with in Mongolia. So reading Genghis Khan's biography, I learned that as a comedian playing in Mongolia, you never give up on a joke, never give up give up on a story. And if that doesn't work, you can always put aristocrats and noblemen into catapults and shoot them against the <laughs> palace walls because that never fails to make the Mongolians laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. man. Well, Tom, thank you. I mean, you've covered the world for us from Mongolia uh, to Amsterdam. Um, Paris. Paris. Yeah. It's been it's been awesome. Oh, Steve. Eddie's going to be in Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. Tom's going to be in Mongolia. Where are you going to be? I'll be in El Monte. <laughs> El Monte. <laughs> August 7th at the Silver Dollar Saloon. Come on out and check me out. Yeah, baby. Eddie, I have so much respect for you. I love you dearly. And, uh, I love I'm, you too, I'm man. I'm thrilled to be on the program. The what? I'm thrilled to be yes. on the program. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. That, that was great. That was great. Yeah. Um, I, I, and I'm really looking forward and to it. And I like you too. Thank you, you Tom. You, you can call me Tommy. That was an honor. I'm, I don't feel right calling any grown man Tommy. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.